Hi everyone. Thanks for coming to our session improving data access and editorial experience for the Center for American Women in Politics. I'm Jessica. Um, this is Sean. We're from Crowd Communications Group. We founded it together in 2012. Um, we focus mostly on um, higher ed clients such as Princeton Rutgers and JCU to name a few. Um, and we also work with nonprofits such as Princeton University Press, Fund for New Jersey, and um, multiple environmental groups. Um, I manage accounts and projects and work on content strategy and site building. And, and I'm a full stack developer and primarily provide design oversight uh, for projects. We began working with the Center for American Women in Politics, um, COP, as you'll hear us refer them to. Back in 2017, we were initially providing Drupal support and building new features for their Drupal 7 site. Um, but after working with them for some time, we experienced how their comprehensive data was very difficult to access publicly. Um, in 2019, they secured funding to create a public-facing database um, where they could share the data that they had collected over the past five decades. After the success of that project, we began to work on a redesign in 2021 for their main website, which included a migration to Drupal 9 and plans to connect that database. Um, in talking about these projects today, we hope that you will better understand strategies for design, site architecture, migrations, and how to leverage core, contrib, and custom modules to build interconnected digital experiences. COP had long been known for having the most complete set of women elected officials data in the nation, but sharing that data was an arduous task for them. Um, whenever the media or a scholar reached out to them, they needed to find the data and send it to them rather than them find it themselves. Um, when uh, The project's goal um, was to build that solution to standardize the data for easy access. The COP data project involved creating a simple design so that the data would shine through. The site needed to also have a consistent brand with their existing Drupal 7 site. So we leveraged that existing design and improved the user interface. Our design strategy relied on building new components for the homepage, search UI, and individual details. To push the design forward, we included iconography, different uses of color, and improved chart styles. Uh, so uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about is the, the fact that we had to do a ton of data migrations for this site. So, and the primary, uh, function of the site is to display all of this wonderful data that they collected um, over time. But this was kind of challenging because, as you can imagine, when you have data from a number of different sources gathered by different people, it's in a bunch of different ways, right? Like they don't call the same thing from one spreadsheet to another spreadsheet. So uh, a lot of what we needed to do was cleaning up and standardizing the format. Um, COP has good internal documentation as to how things map. Uh, when we came into this project, um, and then we basically had to distill from different database sources and CSVs that they were had lying around, um, how to get that data in, so that all this legacy data, going back, I don't know, to like 1800s or something like that, uh, and then they had a newer data provider which started, I think, in the 2010s. Um, so we basically had to write a few different migrations to get the data in. Um, so the legacy data was pretty straightforward. Um, in terms of you know, its data structure, but the challenge here was some of the people in their legacy data were also in the new uh, data uh, provider, and so we need to figure out a way of having unique identifiers for these people, because we didn't want to have um, somebody represented more than once, right? Um, and so ultimately what we did was we generated this unique identifier for their legacy data, we generated a unique identifier, uh, we provided with a unique identifier for their uh, existing provider, 
And then we basically had to do kind of a mapping to make sure we weren't overwriting the same person. Uh, that was slightly challenging, but um, you know, it made life a lot easier in the end because now we just have one record for every person who ever hold, held office. Um, the other challenge here was what they call things and how they wanted to present data isn't necessarily what their providers call data back, uh, that they're getting. So we needed to map like some abbreviated titles to their full titles uh, for positions. We needed to um, figure out which roles were elected roles because especially in state government, um, like the lieutenant governor is generally elected, but you know maybe the attorney general is appointed, right? And so the attorney general in some states is elected, like Texas, but uh, in New Jersey, I don't think that's the case, right? It's an appointment. So um, you know there's a lot of variance across the country as to who's an elected official or not. And this data is really just about people who are elected to office, specifically women elected to office. Um, so there's a whole bunch of basic mappings that had to go through these roles and map them. Ultimately, we settled on this one-to-many uh, relationship. So um, each individual has multiple roles. If somebody had been in Congress, left Congress, came back to Congress, we made a new role for them. But if they were contiguous, so if somebody's in office from 1970 to present day, we didn't change that role. We kept one unique role for the person. And that was partly because of the way the data is coming in from the newest provider. Um, you know, for these for these migrations, we use Core Migrate API, um, and then for basically any migration, we end up using Migrate Plus and Migrate Tools to improve the developer experience of running those migrations. Since we settled on CSVs, we had to use Migrate Source CSV uh, for the project, uh, and then we ultimately had several uh, modules dealing with the migrations. Uh, and within those, they diff had different configuration files. So we had to migrate the roles, we had to migrate the people. Um, in current provider, which is still running today, it runs every month. Basically, we have to import all the statewide uh, elected officials, like governors and things like that. We have to import the state legislatures. We have to import the federal, because uh, those are the three different buckets of files. And across those, um, across that provider, essentially, there's two files that we're getting for each of those audiences, and we're merging them into one nice little CSV for ourselves. Uh, using a Python script. Um, so we just are normalizing the CSV even further. Uh, and then these position totals things is basically like every year, when there, every 10 years when there's a census, the number of seats get reapportioned uh, in Congress. So that changes how many people are in um, office for a given state. So, uh, you know, calculations and things are need to be adjusted. Um, in terms of just module usage for the site, um, we relied heavily on core here, right? Like over 50% of the modules that are in use are core uh, modules. Uh, most of them are editorial experience or fields and things like that. Um, that more, you know, administrative stuff. Uh, we use admin toolbar just to make our admin uh, you know, navigation a little bit easier. Environment indicator just so our editors know if they're editing something on the test site or the live site, which is always helpful when they're checking uh, data imports. Um, use automatic ND labels so we don't have to you know, have uh, the migrations create, um, because names could be the same, right? Like we could have uh, Mary Smith and Mary Smith. We have like a hash value for their names. So we use the automatic entity labels to create those titles that we don't actually end up showing anywhere, but in the back end, that's how we store them. Um, and then inline entity form just to kind of have this nested roles within individuals uh, back end editing interface. Uh, and then from a developer experience, we use better exposed filters for the search. Responsive menus to make responsive menus easier, and Twig Tweak to make rendering data um, more fun. Um, so the, the kind of key thing on this site is that almost all of what people do on the site is do searches. Um, and so what we see here is uh, just an example of the individual search interface. Um, and so we need to provide a consistent set of filters uh, across five different contexts. So somebody could search for by people, somebody could search by position, primarily uh, race, ethnicity, party, and location. So they can look at the data uh, from different points of view. Um, and so, um, you know, to build this search experience, we just stuck with views. Uh, it works really well uh, for what we needed. Uh, it's not a high traffic site, so we don't need to leverage something like solar for this, although we could, um, but it just added more complexity than was ne necessary for the project. Um, we have some lightweight helper modules which just deal with the complexity of uh, 
and it's hard to see right here. Under this filter by date, there's this little radio button that says currently in office or show all years. And so when you toggle that on and off, it does basically a Boolean check to see if it's the current year or not for the person's role. Uh, and then if you select show all years, you can either search for people who served during a year or who served at the end of year. So uh, COP is, provides this year-end data. So they want to say, like, on December 31st, how many women were in office, in any office that's elected? Uh, so that's this weird differentiation. But it required a custom module to alter the query that uh, was making it. Um, and then the other thing is just grouping the roles and the people was somewhat complicated, so we just split that out into a little helper module. Um, and then uh, one other thing here is just the, the select filters. Uh, all these things are selects, right? Like there's a finite number of parties, but somebody can start typing in them for Democrat or Republican or independent, and they'll get like a little auto-complete box uh, experience. So, you know, just a little nicety that people are familiar with from like, um, you know, searching on other sites. Um, well, last thing I'm going to talk about, I think, on this project is that uh, another key feature was of the search UI was that three of the five contexts actually have visualizations. Uh, we leveraged this library called High Charts um, for those um, for those charts. You know, you can use Google Charts, D3JS. There's a whole bunch of different charting libraries. We chose this one because it's the one they were using already on their site, so we already had good examples of how they were using it. Um, the kind of interesting thing here is we uh, have a custom module that returns or there's a custom block. Uh, conditionally based on the route of the search. Uh, and then all of these things are built with React. So it's kind of partially decoupled. Um, and the JSON for those, um, the API, uh, which is JSON for these charts, comes from the same views that the search works on, which was a little bit tricky, but um, it's, it's kind of battle tested at this point. Um, the site allows users to create a account, um, and once they have an authenticated user account, they're able to share the data that they find on social media. Um, they're able to download raw data um, in CSV or JSON formats, and they're able to search. Um, they're able to save their searches so that they can go back to them at another time. Um, this was a benefit to both the users and also to the COP team because it reduces the level of effort to access the data and um, allows the COP data to be more readily used by researchers and the media. As you can see, I don't know if you can see on the screen there, but there's, those are just your options. But in on the real screen, there's a login at the top that you would have to create your account first to be able and, to. And if you're not logged in, it essentially when you go to download it, it says, you need to be logged in to do this. And then it prompts people to log in. This way we capture the per people's information. Right, because COP wanted to know who's, who's downloading their data. Um, this uh, project launched as a Drupal 8 site in June of 2020. Um, and COP's been pleased with it, um, with the functionality of it, and we continue to improve upon it. Um, as time goes on, um, but at the end of 2021, when um, the new COP site launched, um, we upgraded this site from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9, and we themed it to match the new main COP website, which we'll talk about momentarily. Um, and now, <laughs> we'll discuss how we worked with COP to redesign and upgrade their Drupal 7 site to Drupal 9 and leverage the COP data site to deliver dynamic data. With every design project that we start, we usually ask for our clients to provide us with sites that they admire so that we can get an idea of their likes and dislikes. And um, as we discuss we find out the overall feeling that they're trying to evoke. Um, in this case, they really wanted the data needed to have some seriousness to it, but they wanted it to be not seen as dull or boring. So we needed to make sure that there was images and things that added a little bit of extra interest. Um, 
Through several iterations, um, we explored different colors. Initially, they didn't want to do a red and blue site. Um, they wanted to make sure that they appeared nonpartisan because they're a nonpartisan organization. Um, but ultimately, the stakeholders felt that um, they needed to stick with the red and blue to stay on brand with other sites in the Eagleton Center of Politics at Rutgers. Um, so while this seems like a really minor <laughs> decision, it was a little bit tricky for us to make sure that there was a completely even balance of red and blue on the site so that you didn't hit a page that was mostly red or mostly blue. Um, so once the design direction was decided, um, we used the various components we created to provide front end implementation details um, to use in the theme. And so here's, here's uh, an example of one of the components. Uh, like I said, we've worked on the Drupal 7 site, so we kind of knew the pain points of the editing experience, the lack of flexibility of it all, the fact that it didn't align with the front end of the website. Uh, so we designed these components uh, early on and then implemented them. Uh, and here it's, again, two variants of the same component. Um, you know, and on the back end, this is a paragraph, um, which is called chart group. Uh, and what you see on the right here is essentially like the style field. So there's like a style field, group style, group alignment. Uh, so it can be red, it can be blue, it can be two columns, it can be three columns, it can be stacked. Like there's different things an editor can choose from to make the page have visual interest because these pages are super data heavy in, in, in a lot of cases. So um, this gave us quick little variables that change classes that allowed us to rearrange content um, and make it look different, which is super helpful. Um, and then, you know, the other thing here is that within each of those chart groups, you have charts, so you can have as many, uh, you know, sub things as you want. Eventually they'll wrap to two rows and things like that um, without the editor having to be involved. Um, and the kind of key uh, piece here is that um, there's a field, which is here, which is called data source, uh, and that has about five or six options, um, the one being manual, and that's kind of what you see in this middle screen is the field set somebody would see if they selected manual, and then uh, uh, it, they, we had them called dynamic, but we remapped them to their specific <laughs> endpoint names, uh, which is this other uh, side here. So when somebody chooses either individual, again, these, back, these five contexts, Right, individual, position, party, race, ethnicity, location, um, we can query the data from the COP data site using this little form, which basically says, well, what, what do you want? What year do you want? Uh, there's a little checkbox for current. Um, what level of office? So let's say we can say, uh, we want the current year, we want governors, uh, and we want governors in the Northeast. So we just add the like five or six states we want to put there, right? And then that's going to return us uh, data for uh, this component to be filled in with. Um, but again, because we're using conditional fields, like you never see these two things simultaneously. You only ever see one. So the form's a little bit um, less daunting than it appears on this slide. Um, and here's just a few other components on the site. Uh, the first is the table. The site uses a lot of tables. Um, in the old site, all of these tables were done in the WYSIWYG editor. So for those of you who have made a table in Drupal in CK editor, you know the pain of that. Uh, you can't add a row in the middle. You can't rearrange them. You can't upload a CSV and just magically have it look nice. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that like tables in the WYSIWYG editor are bad at. Uh, and we ended up using table field module. Uh, to uh, help uh, the process of adding manual tables on the site. Um, and so basically this gives a greater control. Um, it allows upload from uh, CSV, so like they constantly have new data. So like right now it's an election cycle, right? So like every few weeks there's another primary and data has to get updated. They just upload another CSV and it overwrites. So like just takes a lot of pain out of dealing with the tables that they used to have to do. Um, and you know, the other thing here is like you can see like right there it says like export table data. So all of these tables are exportable too. So like researchers or other people can come along and grab this information. Because um, again, we're coming from a CSV 90% of the time. Uh, so it can get spit back out of that. Um, we have a card component. Uh, everybody has a card component these days. Uh, again, this can be fed manually or dynamically uh, from the top data site. And we additionally have this standalone little chart thing, which also uses a high charts library on the back end, 
Uh, this uses the charts module, and it gives them like a you know build your build your own adventure chart. Um, they can select the chart type, bar, pie, stack, all these other things. They can put the specific data in, labels, colors, um, just so they have uh, more control to do these manual charts that they don't necessarily have uh, coming from the dynamic set. Um, when we did our content audit um, from the Drupal 7 to the Drupal 9 site, um, we reduced the content types quite a bit um, from 16 to 11, and some of those were us replacing um, existing with new ones. Like we merged the author and staff into a person content type um, and used a multi select taxonomy for the person type because they had the same person stored in two different places on their previous site. Um, for content items, we went from around 2,800 to around 2,200 and rebuilt about 100 of them. Um, complex pages where data needed to use components were rebuilt and we needed to rebuild web forms. Um, we went from 28 custom entity types um, to 14 paragraph types um, because on Drupal, the Drupal 9 site, we moved over to using paragraphs. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, 354 custom entity items, um, we rebuilt those as needed. And 17 vocabularies roughly stayed the same. We replaced some of them. Um, as we dropped some, we added new ones and uh, re reduced the terms by about 30. So uh, similar to the other migration slide, uh, you know, we wanted to minimize the amount of content on this site that uh, needed custom migrations, and we didn't want to have to rebuild 500 pages, although I think it feels like we've rebuilt a lot more pages than 100 sometimes. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, you know, we wanted to migrate as much data as cleanly as possible from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9, which was somewhat challenging. Um, and so what we did is we used the um, core Migrate API again, um, but we used Migrate Drupal, and so Migrate Drupal is a core module, and we stubbed out all of our migrations and then grabbed the configuration from those so we could plop them into our custom uh, migration uh, that we wrote for the site. So we didn't actually use the Drupal to Drupal path. We just took what we wanted from it and then customized it from there, um, which made you know like remapping like people and things like that a lot easier. Um, we also stepped out all those data pages like those hundred things, so at least there was a placeholder of like, oh, we need to put data into the site and rebuild it from the ground up, um, so that we knew it was there. Um, and then, you know, again as I mentioned, like we just used Migrate Plus and Migrate Tools and pretty much everything. Um, another thing. In doing these, like you know, uh, for those of you who've done migrations, um, you end up rolling back and checking things, and you know, making sure things are going to port over properly. Especially when we're working with files and media and all this other stuff. And so uh, we use Migrate Debug module too, that would like let us see what was going to come from the source uh, and to the destination, so we could make sure that the mappings looked right uh, and things of that nature. Um, and then in the case of the site, so we essentially had 31 uh, migration configurations to move all this stuff over. Um, so a lot of stuff. Um. Um, having worked with COP for some time at their Drupal 7 site, we were aware of what their, need, their editors really needed to improve the editor experience. Um, their 7 site used custom entities and the way the back end was configured, there was a lot of horizontal tabs um, to add parts of the pages. So what the editor got on the back end was not what they were then visually getting on the front end. So the custom entities weren't flexible and several of them relied on static JSON files being updated in the code base, which made it very difficult for someone who wasn't a developer to even edit something as simple as an, a year and a number in a chart. Additionally, archived data was copied as static HTML, which made it hard to adjust after archiving and also removed any flexibility in terms of design being applied because of how the markup was rendered. Um, the Drupal 7 site was using the Core 7 theme for content administration 
when we were upgrading the site to Drupal 9, one of our key goals was to improve this editor experience. Um, the editing form is now linear and it closely maps to how the front end is constructed. So when editors are editing, they're, they've been very happy <laughs> to know that what they're getting on the back end is what pretty much they're gonna see when the front end is published. Um, we leverage paragraphs on the Drupal 9 site instead of custom entities. Um, those paragraphs are flexible, so they have more than one style option and data source option, and they no longer rely on static files being updated. Now we clone those data pages and we just edit the year values to update them from the COP data site and the structure of the page remains the same. Um, we've been an early adopter of Claro as an admin theme, so they've been benefiting from the modern editorial experience, which um, will be the default for all new installs um, for 9.4 and higher starting next month. Uh, back to module usage. So. Um... You know, in the case of this project, again, we're going to use more contrib because it's a more a more complex site. Um, and again, the contrib modules, a lot of them are about editor experience still, right? So you see a lot of the same ones that we used on the other one. Uh, a couple things to call out here is we use this module called Big Menu. So if you ever have a site, uh, from an information architecture standpoint, um, COP wanted to keep all of their legacy data, right? So we, we didn't really drop anything. We kept it. We reorganized it a little bit to make it a little bit clearer where things were and how they make sense. Um, but we still have this gigantic menu, right? Like everything's nested and it goes down and down and down. And as you can imagine, dragging and dropping something from one spot to another is extremely hard when you have like a thousand pages in your menu. Um, so Big Menu actually lets you drill every level down so that you can kind of more easily manage the menu system. Um, charts I mentioned, we also have this thing called Content Lock. So like anybody here use SharePoint? Like you ever have to check out a document in SharePoint? I and mean, this is the same idea. So in Drupal, essentially, it, it will kind of prompt somebody if they try to edit something that's being edited on, right? So uh, as somebody starts editing a piece of content, if another person comes along and says, like, this content is currently locked, right? So you don't have somebody overwriting you know, the same page at the same time. Um, it's something they had in Drupal 7 sites, so we want to make sure they had a similar experience in Drupal 9. Um, that then gets into this problem, which is people like leave the tab open, you know, and then have to unlock it. But um, you know, it's not been really that big of an issue. Um, we install this editorially module, um, which is uh, maintained by Princeton WDS, and it gives editors an insight uh, on the front end of the site uh, so they can see potential um, accessibility issues, uh, things like the structure of the page, if there's missing alt text, things like that. Like. Easy, easy accessibility wins from an editor experience that they could come along and fix. Um, quick no clone is the way we get those pages, the data pages duplicated. Um, and then I talked about table field. And then uh, the previous site also embedded views in pages. So we kind of kept that same model for some other pages or like they needed like intro text and then a view. Um, so we kind of kept that model. Um, we use this view field argument helper module that allows them to just type in which taxonomy terms they want to show up on the page uh, rather than making a whole bunch of different views, one specific for each uh, page. Uh, and then, you know, from the developer experience uh, side, we really leaned into conditional fields. We had to use a little bit of custom uh, module here because of the way paragraphs and conditional fields are still not 100% working together. Um, but that gave us not a terribly overwhelming uh, back-end interface for editors. Uh, HTML titles, so they have a bunch of like registered trademarks and trademark symbols in some of their page titles, and Drupal doesn't play nice with those things. Uh, so this module allows us to do that. Um, this redirect import thing, so if you ever do a big migration, their, um, their paths change drastically, right? They were underscores for some reason on the old site, and now they're hyphens, and you know, it, a whole bunch of things change. So this just basically gave us a way of dumping out their old path list, mapping it to the new path list, uh, and then we just import a CSV and it writes all those redirects for us so we don't have to uh, think too much about it. Um, and then on the user experience side, uh, 
one of the features they had from a third party thing they were using was the ability to sort tables on the front end. So any manual added table uh, in um, the WYSIWYG can do this, and any table in the table field can do this, and any dynamic table can also do it, um, just by having a class around that table. And it just basically lets you have a little sort option on all the fields of the site. Which again, is helpful if you're trying to find a specific state or something. Um, and so, just going back to that interconnecting data, um, after all this is done, we have these new components that can populate this stuff. So a lot of the rebuilding was about implementing the, the, the data connections between the ops holders data and this site. Uh, and so now editors can define the component they want, table, card, um, something else, um, and just how it should render on the front end. So should it be red, should it be blue, should it be this kind of table, like with stretch, should it shrink, should it scroll, should it have a sorting option, should there be a link out to the data site, should it do all these other things, do I need a jump link to this thing, right? Um, and then basically, um, that little form we saw earlier basically makes a API, uh, API request to the COP data site, it returns JSON, and then we basically push that off to the front end to deal with uh, the display layer. Um, and this has worked out really well, right? So, um, you know, they're able to now uh, leverage this huge amount of data, which you were basically dealing with manually on the old 777 site. And now they don't have to type a table. They just say, I want data from Nebraska in 2019 for state legislature. And they get a nice table or a chart or whatever they want for it. Um, so uh, it goes a long way to helping the data tell a story too on their site. Um, we launched this site in December 2021, um, just as COP was celebrating their 50th year. Um, and during that time, we added, right at the same time as launch, um, the COP 50 timeline, um, which included photos and um, events that had taken place at COP over those 50 years with women in politics. and then a separate timeline that went along with it that involved women and elected officials um, that were not directly related to COP. Um, we continue to add functionality to the site even today. Um, we're continuing to support the site. Um, it's been a privilege helping them to bring their women elected official uh, data that they've collected over these past 50 years um, to the public. And um, since launch, we've added additional features um, and uh, we're excited to see how it continues to grow. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> well, so currently COP has a lot of mayor and um, local official data, but it's not it's not in the database. Um, so one of our next steps is to add local official office holders data to the database. Um, they have increasingly more data about mayors and local office holders and um, that's the plan for the near future. Um, and then later in the future, they would like to add candidates to the database, um, which is a whole whole other <laughs> project um, and um, yeah and this one is basically like uh, I, another dream would be that the person who's managing the COP data site would just be able to copy the URL of the search that they did and paste it into the website and just magically get a table right so like uh, instead of having to fill out the form if they already know what they want can they just get it from the from the COP site uh, COP data site so that that is easy enough, we just have to kind of write the logic in there uh, and, and build it out and test it. So that's another another way to make this easier for them uh, to connect these two things. And hopefully you could see how both of these projects benefited from intense planning and migration of the migrations and content structures and collaborating to deliver great experiences for all the users of the site. Questions. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Sure. Yes. First of all, the menu is a wonderful site. It's a great resource. Oh, thank you. Um, for anybody that's interested in running for office and politics and 
have with volunteers. Uh, so, uh, I guess my main question is, are you, are the data, is it streaming from government sites or do you actually like, I do manually go in there and submit your candidacy? I mean, how does that work? So the current provider, um, which is a company called Nohu, um, basically provides them uh, a dump every month of all the candidates who've, who've registered with the FEC or whatever, submitted their paperwork, uh, as well as all the people who are in office that they track. They have, like, we're not even importing like the majority of that data set. We're really importing just the, the individuals and the roles. They have like bios and what religion they are and how many kids they have and like all this crazy information that we don't need on the site. But um, we're just parsing that, that data source uh, currently, which a number of other institutions could use too. Yeah. One more question, but sure. for someone that is actually running for office as a committee person in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Oh, exciting. Um, so, thank you. Um, one of the things is the hardest to find out is who is your local committee person. It took me, I, I, I kid you not, like several years to figure out who was, who was the Democratic committee person in my neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and that type of that, just for the state of New Jersey alone. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Because I don't think people realize that they can run for office, you know, and that, you know, that that's an opportunity that if you, if you are, are interested in politics, there are ways to start out. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Yeah, and again, that's like... <laughs> that's kind you, of a dream of yeah, theirs. Yeah, they have a lot of information <laughs> about New Jersey, like who the chairs are at different county levels. They don't get more granular than that currently. Um, but again, like... A lot of that data is now you have to manually get that from people, right? And so that's like, they could probably do it in New Jersey, but probably beyond New Jersey would be uh, yeah. a heavy lift. It's a big wish list. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Sure. Um, so this monthly data dump, is that what led you to the import via CSV solution? Yeah, they give us the data in two different ways. They give it us as SQL tables and they give it to us as uh, CSVs. Um, but we had to merge two different data points together anyway to kind of make the, the unique record we wanted to import. So all their other data was in CSV format, so we just passively threw this inside. And yeah. so this is an ongoing process? Yep. Yeah, it's month not, monthly. How automated is it? Um, it will be more automated. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, basically getting that file is the hard part of the migrations could run on a cron job, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a, it, it gets delivered every third Monday or something like that, so we could always run it on a specific day and time. Um, we haven't turned that on because we do have to do this data transformation piece. Uh, we've been looking at doing like that on AWS, with some um, functions, because we again, we're writing a Python script against six different CSVs. Four of those CSVs share the same name, <laughs> which is problematic. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just a matter of getting it to a point where we can host it on S3 and have S3, you know, have Amazon run that function for us, and then you know we just have it run every so many days or whatever. Yes. Did you consider any like data visualization tools like Tableau? <laughs> no, not for this. Um, they were already using this high charts library. They kind of had a finite set of charts they wanted, so it didn't really make sense to do another third party thing. They use, what did they use? What is that thing called? They use a third party service they for like do, making fancy charts. Think of what it's but like called. then they were building like. Uh, AM charts? No, no. Oh, Infogram. 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 And so, but like then they were like, instead of just building a chart and popping it on the page, which would be fine, um, then they would build out like the entire page in Infogram. So like, it like kind of defeated the purpose of like having a triple website in some parts. And so we've, we've kind of gone back and forth. Uh, the reason we added that charts module is essentially to fulfill like a request to be more like an infogram. Um, again, you know, it, it's all about like, that's like a snazzy, you know, JavaScript based thing where they just drag and drop stuff and it just magically works. Drupal's not that, right? So uh, it's a little bit more heavy of a lift from, from that person's experience. But, you know, I think we're probably like 80% coverage of the features and functionality of it. Question uh, I was wondering if you had to do anything in particular to like deal with like continuity from the old site to the new one as far as like URL paths or sort of redirects. 
Uh, yeah, and so that's uh, when I was talking about the module usage. We use this thing called redirect import, and so there's like almost no, no like the old website used underscores, and the naming convention was bonkers. And then the the new one we standardized that. It's all hyphenated, you know. So like it's a very different um, URL path uh, URL paths to get the same page even. Um, and so again, we we took a right before launch, we took a. Yeah, we wrote a SQL query to get the <coughs> node IDs and the paths for everything on the old site. The existing, the new node ID, the node ID, which was the same node ID, we kept node IDs uh, consistent across the two sites. Um, otherwise, we could have joined them in the migrate table. And then what the path was on the new site, and just made a file, dumped that in, made all our redirects for us. So, you know, we, for the most part, I said probably like 95 plus percent of the paths were like already had a map. Like of where they should go. So. And then, like, if anything didn't make it, was there like a kind of catch all like thing? Yeah. So we have the redirect 404 module turned on, which will which will like kind of give you a button to say like, oh, you had a 404. Do you want to write a redirect for that? Uh, again, the majority of uh, 404s that happen on Drupal websites are for people trying to access WordPress. Your browser. <laughs> it's like auto discovered by XML. No, that doesn't exist. Um, you know. Uh, WP admin, nope, that doesn't exist. Like, you know, it's just people just bot scrolling the site for random things. But um, for the most part, we got, um, you know, everything we needed uh, from that perspective. Awesome. Sure. You know, the great thing about Drupal is you have all these contributing modules and you can put these together. And I was just curious if you, in terms of going from like Drupal 7 to Drupal 9, whether you had comments in terms of how those modules were working together. Did you find issues where you were trying to put modules together, and either from an interface point of view or just not even programmatically working? Yeah. Did you did you get into conflicts? Um, you know, just generally, how do you feel about um, using different modules? And, you know, do you what's your confidence level? Yeah. I, I mean, we try to use things that are battle tested and we know are well maintained, right? There's always going to be that one module you need to install, and like only 50 sites use it, right? Uh, so like we're trying to minimize how many of those we install on the site. Um, the the kind of biggest pain point was between paragraphs and conditional fields, uh, and they don't they don't play nice when there's nested paragraphs. Um, so we actually have a custom module that's doing a whole bunch of checking to do those that like table show hide thing. Um, which eventually will land in paragraphs, it just hasn't yet. I mean, it's something we could contribute back to. Um, but like, you know, the maintainer on that issue was like, I need to rewrite the whole thing. It's like, okay, so don't waste my time on this and just write a custom module. Right. Yeah, so, you know, th that's the route we went with for this. Otherwise, you know, we're using the top like 50 modules, you know, MetaTag, Google Analytics, right? It's all the standard stuff everybody installs. Uh, nothing too crazy. Charts, modules a little. Funky, but um, that's more from the other one. Did you find like when you assemble all these things together and it's all working sort of yeah, as you expect? Not having weird, too, too, too weird of issues, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, if there's no other questions, it's lunchtime. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Thank you.